start at the beginning, why don't you? I'm going to start at the beginning. <laughs> Hey everyone and welcome back to Do What You Can For The People, the show that nobody asked for. I'm here today with one of my OG Miami babes, Cassie. Cassie is currently pursuing a master's degree in art therapy and is one of the most talented witchy artists I know. She's designed the Sacred Arts Book of Hours in partnership with Brianna Saucy. A Book of Hours is our way of making plans. By paying close attention to the stars above and the earth below, by asking the needed questions, not once in a while, but on a regular basis, because consistent practices nourishes our sovereignty. Hell she yeah. also makes one-of-a-kind block prints. They shimmer, they shine. They're carved, hand-pulled prints inspired by the majesty of the natural world and emblems of elemental power. If you haven't guessed it by now, Cassie's my go-to queen of the cosmos, and I'm so excited <laughs> to have her on the show today. Hi, Cassie. And Hi. I'll wear the crown if you give it to me. <laughs> Hey everybody, I'm very, very into all of this stuff, quite obviously, so I'm excited to get started. Let's get started then, and we're going to kick things off with a little bit of background information on astrology. So astrology is defined as the search for human meaning in the sky. It seeks to understand general and specific human behavior through the influence of planets and other celestial objects. I did a little bit of digging because I was just curious about the history of astrology, and I found out that natal astrology began around 600 BC, but astrology as a whole actually got its beginnings around 3000 BC in Mesopotamia. Babylonians invented astrology as a way to predict seasons and other celestial events to help plan out their farming schedules. Astrological symbols represented seasonal tasks and were used as a yearly almanac of listed activities to remind the community to do things appropriate to the season or weather, things like harvesting, gathering shellfish, sowing crops. From there, different cultures took the Babylonian beliefs and created their own beliefs and rules around it. So the Egyptians took it and used it as a system for measuring time according to the constellations and started the practice of reading natal horoscopes. Greece and Rome used astrology to read horoscopes for emperors. Tiberius was the first emperor to have a court astrologer. And astrologer Claudius Ptolemy, Ptolemy? we'll go with it, was so obsessed with getting horoscopes accurate that he began the first attempt to make an accurate world map so that he could chart the relationship between a person's birthplace and the skies. And in doing so, he actually coined the term geography, which I thought was really cool. And very interesting for me because that is what I have my undergraduate degree in. <laughs> Seriously, if you need to know about rocks, go talk to Cassie. Yeah, you can talk to me about rocks and life <laughs> forms in general. <laughs> India and China combined religion and superstition with astrology in an effort to make it relatable to the local public. And there's actually a very prominent tradition in India to this day of matching birth charts of to be engaged couples and using those charts to find the most auspicious date for their wedding. Mm -hmm. Medieval and Renaissance Europe, their astrology there was a part of everyday medical practices. Mm -hmm. uh, doctors combined Galenic medicine with studies of the stars. And physicians across Europe were required by law to calculate the position of the moon before carrying out complicated medical procedures such as surgery or bleeding. Really interesting stuff. Yeah, um, yeah. Cassie, is there anything else that you've come across in your research of astrology? I mean, I'm sure there's tons. I mean, there's, there's just so much because so many ancient cultures use some form of mapping the sky to understand facets of their own culture. Um, the, the blood and guts uh, <laughs> idea is a, is a really funny one, but it kind of makes sense because culturally they would have assigned different planets, different domains of the body, just like you would have assigned uh, different parts of the sky with a zodiac sign if you're looking at a natal chart to map up the sky. So it makes sense. You want to map the self as much as you want to map the heavens. So true. And I think that's why I've always had a personal interest in astrology. So for me, viewing my life through a cosmic lens kind of brings a certain amount of peace to me. When I feel like things are happening outside of my control, it's really comforting for me to think about fate and destiny. Mm -hmm. um, on top of that, it's also been a source of self-mastery. So there are a lot of traits assigned with specific 
um, astrological signs and where different planets are placed in your natal chart. And so understanding my traits and how they're unique to me, how I can harness them most effectively, how they can manifest on my dark side if I use them incorrectly has been really important in understanding how to be the best version of myself. Um, I've gone not super far down the rabbit hole. If you ask me, ooh, tell me about your astrological signs. I could tell you I'm a Capricorn sun, but I'll probably say I'm a Capri sun because that's more <laughs> fun, which means that I'm diligent and caretaking. But if I manifest that on the wrong side, I can come out as stubborn and controlling. Uh, I do know I'm a Virgo moon, which means I'm calm and analytical when I'm by myself, but it can come off to other people as being cautious and cold. And I'm a Leo rising, which means that I'm noble and influential, especially in social settings, um, but it can also be perceived as performative and insensitive. And Cassie, I'd love for you to tell us a little bit about why you care about astrology and maybe how you got into it. Ooh, how I got into it. I, I don't think I could actually pinpoint the exact moment, but I feel like maybe when I was much, much younger, and I was listening to a song and they mentioned a zodiac sign and I, I didn't have an understanding of what that meant. And then I looked, I'm pretty sure I'm thinking of heart-shaped box, to be honest with you. <laughs> she eyes me like a Pisces. Yeah, that's possible. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> I needed to know. Yeah. Um, you know, rock and roll was speaking to me. Uh, but probably, I mean, probably my mom, she had a birthday book. So when you have the birthday book, you're obviously going to look at your exact birthday and you're going to figure out just how much this book is telling you who you are. <laughs> birthday so. books are such a black hole for time. Like I remember our friend and your roommate, Stacy Kuhn, had the birthday yeah, book. She absolutely had the birthday book. <laughs> and we would just sit in the dorms and like have some wine and, and flip through it and Wine Thursdays. Wine Thursdays. Wine Thursdays. The birthday book was broken out several times during Wine Thursdays. Oh man, undergrad, what a time to be alive. It was a time. <laughs> uh, so one of the things that I learned from Cassie about astrology, um, because I thought it was like, oh cool, I have a horoscope, but then I started digging a little bit more and I realized that there's a, there's a few different ways to do it. So there's whole sign versus the commonly used Placidus or Placidus or however you say it, Cassie, that system. And can you tell us a little bit about how those are different? Yeah. So there's a few different ways of looking at the sky. Um, I think in traditional Indian, uh, I don't know if they would even call it a natal chart, but they use something called side reel which I hope I'm saying correctly. There's several different ways to look at the sky, just like there's several different ways to look at your life. Um, what I love about the whole sign chart system is that it places your rising sign within the first house that determines the sign of your first house. And then it proceeds naturally through the belt of the zodiac. So if you are a rising Leo, right? the next sign that will naturally follow in the zodiacal year is Virgo. So your second house is going to be Virgo and any planets within that is also going to be Virgo. The Placida system has unequal sized slices of the astrological pie, um, which means some planets can be in different signs within the same house. But I think philosophically for me, whole signs make a whole lot more sense because it is 12 even slices of the pie just like there are 12 zodiac signs that are evenly sliced throughout time over the year um, and it is also one of the older ways of exploring the sky so i grant a lot of credit to something that doesn't have to be mathematically perfect in order to be understood this is much much easier uh, philosophically and psychologically if you want to look at a natal chart as more of a transformative lens that you can use for inward reflection, you can do it with whole signs and have an understanding that makes a lot more natural sense to a person sometimes. Love that. Um, so let's maybe give the people an example. You have prepared a lovely whole sign chart of mine. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And maybe you could talk us through this a little bit. Um, start at the beginning, why don't you? I'm going to start at the beginning. Okay. <laughs> so here's the deal. You know you are a sun sign Capricorn. Most people relate directly and only 
uh, to their sun sign, they come across it, they read their zodiac horoscope from their sun sign, and I'm here to tell you that you should be doing it from your rising sign instead. Huh. The reason is, your rising sign is the sign on the eastern horizon when you take your first breath. It tells the rest of the chart where all of your planets live in each of the houses. It is highly specific. The rising sign changes every like five to 25 minutes, depending on which time of the year you are. It's highly specific. Wow. And it colors really everything about what your natal chart is. So I would say if you're reading a horoscope that is time-based, like any horoscope is, and you want to be as specific as possible, you would want to use your rising sign more than your sun sign to understand what's going on astrologically because it's going to color what is happening with the planets as they move through your own natal houses. Very cool. Mm -hmm. Is your rising sign always in your first house? I would assume yes. Yes. Yeah. Your okay. rising sign determines your first house. Got it. So for, for the whole sign chart, you have Leo in your first house. You see it gives you eight degrees. If you're using a Placidus chart, it's going to be the start of your first house. Got it. So before we go any further, what exactly is a house and what is the purpose? Can you? So houses are arenas of life. They're a universal pattern of different stages that events in your life take place on. So an easy way to understand this natal chart when you're looking at it and you're seeing a bunch of shapes and glyphs and lines is the house is going to be the stage an event or situation takes place on, an arena of your life. The planets within the house are the actors, and the zodiac sign that the planets have are the costumes that they wear, or their style and their flair. So in your first house, your house of identity is your house of self. You have Leo, and it's by itself, and it's saying, I am me, and it's standing on the stage of the first house of your life. So it is an unimpeded expression of your ascendant, right? What do you know about Leo rising already or what maybe do you identify with a whole lot that you have learned? Sure. So what I know about Leos is that they tend to be very, I don't want to say dramatic or theatrical, but I'm going to say dramatic and theatrical. Yeah. They like to be the center of attention, which I definitely was as a kid. I loved being on camera. I loved being around the adults and knowing that I was cute and sassy and fun. Mm -hmm. So that makes a lot of sense for me. Yeah, it also makes a lot of sense for a video podcaster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it, your ascendant, it's the most personal part of a chart, right? It's what we want to be known for. And it's also motivation for living out this life. It's the identity that you move through. And it, quite often, it's how other people view you, whether you realize it or not. Mm -hmm. So being a Leo rising is not a bad thing to be. <laughs> I'll take it. Yeah. So it's it's really when you're looking at your rising sign from the lens of a house system you want to think about a couple of really big important things the sign that it is in which is leo you were right dramatic but also noble very very great in leadership capacity where is the crown well <laughs> <laughs> the crown well uh the other big piece of this puzzle is the planet that rules the zodiac so your sun, uh, your rising sign is in Leo, and the planet that rules Leo is the sun. Mm -hmm. So you have a lot of uh, synergy going on between your sun, which we will get to in a stacked old sixth house, as you can see in a second, Absolutely. and your rising yeah. sign, they feed, they feed into each other. Got so it. it's important to know your ascendant, and it's also important to know the planetary ruler of your ascendant. For me, my rising sign is Scorpio, to nobody's surprise whatsoever. It means I'm very comfortable talking about the mysterious and mystical and oh dark side of basically anything. Um, and, and that ruler, depending on who you ask, is Mars or Pluto. Pluto. Both. Yeah, it depends. If you're using whole sign, um, whole sign readers generally will tend to side with Mars because whole sign systems were really introduced before Pluto was even discovered as a planet. Hmm. Um, but is it still a planet? Unclear, right? Yeah, yeah. 
Um, at the same time, in my first house, I have my rising sign and Pluto right next to it. So it's kind of hard for me to ignore the influence of Pluto on my ascendant. It's kind of hard for me to say Mars is the only ruler of that ascendant. But for you, it's quite clear the sun is the ruler of Leo and your rising sign is in Leo. So it is all about how you show up for other people and it is about your motivation. So can you speak to that idea? Like how can you see yourself having Leonine motivation qualities? Yeah, I think I'm definitely a leader, um, not just in terms of what a lot of people see in my professional setting, but you can attest to this. Every time we go for a music festival, I'm the first one to make the spreadsheet and I'm doing the head counts and all of that. And I, the head counts for sure. <laughs> Uh, and I think, yeah, I would consider myself a fairly motivational person. I think people look to me when they need motivation for hustle, which is always a nice thing to be looked at. So, The other part of a Leo rising individual is that they really are motivated to provide a gregarious performance to their friends. So something that I know about you is you love to make the group laugh. Yes. That is a very Leo rising thing to want to be doing for other people. <laughs> it is oh it's performance and service of the people, yeah. but it is also appreciating the like warmth and acceptance and applause that you receive from the performance itself. It's a fuel for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, totally agree with born all of that. Born to be the center of things, expressing yourself it. with flair comes quite naturally to you. <laughs> All right, what else we got in here? All right, we have your moon in Virgo, which is in your second house. So your second house is your house of resources, assets, livelihood, material resources, and psychological resources. But it really is about the tools you use and the way that you address your own assets. So moon in Virgo, I know that you touched on briefly before. Um, what else? do you know about Moon in Virgo or would you directly connect with already? So I could be wrong about this, but I'm pretty sure that Moon in Virgo are people who are a little bit introverted. Um, they are hard workers. They really value their alone time so far as on par. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And those are all things that, that I totally identify with. Every time I see a meme about Moon in Virgo, I'm like, oh my God, that's me. That is 100% me. I think it's one of the things that I identify the most with whenever I see stuff online. Yep. And that's going to make sense because the moon speaks to your daily physical and emotional experience. Um, it really is the way in which you unravel your life's purpose on a daily scenario. Just like the moon changes zodiac signs once or twice a day. Sometimes it takes a couple of days to change. It's very, it moves through life day to day, you know spells out the month for you. So the moon reveals how do you meet your physical and emotional needs. Um, the zodiac sign will tell you a little bit about that. So Virgo needs to clear, organize, purify, really, really important that they calibrate things to their proper operational capacity. Ring any bells? <laughs> yes, a lot. <laughs> uh, bullet journaler, Max. Yes. <laughs> Stress uh, cleaner, really, definitely. That calibration, like optimum capacity, working conditions, um, organization, that is how a moon in Virgo will regulate themselves emotionally. And I see your beautifully laid out bullet journal pages, yeah. and I think this is the most moon in Virgo a person could possibly be. <laughs> I think that combined with the fact that whenever the going gets tough, the first thing I'll do is deep clean everything in yes. sight or reorganize all the furniture that I have yep. available to me. Yep. The process of refining is what soothes the soul for a moon in Virgo. That's a, that is absolutely the name of the game for a moon in Virgo. And on the other side, you can tear everything to pieces in search of a solution. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so these are the ways that you emotionally regulate and emotionally dysregulate in a given day. Uh, yeah, pretty, pretty spot on. Very um, true of me. The house that your moon sits in is going to tell you where you meet the physical and emotional needs. So the second house is, as we said, the house of resources and assets. So a moon in Virgo in the second house is going to want to create security through the development of resources. 
as well as the maintenance of those resources. So Virgo, a lovely earth sign uh, also, as you should know, um, is also earth-minded in the way that they approach pragmatically uh, what can and should be done in terms of resource development. So the development of earthly resources rings really true for you here and I'm I can tell you that here. with total confidence because I know about the work that you do. <laughs> yeah I'm just sitting here laughing I'm like huh did I really choose a career as a sustainability consultant in research <laughs> management or did it choose me or is it both? <laughs> it's probably both. Probably both. Probably both. Um, a sun in Capricorn determines and chooses for themselves but at the very same time the a moon in Virgo is going to be hold towards what fulfills them emotionally and physically day to day. So I'd say both. Let's go with both. <laughs> so yeah, you have your moon in Virgo sitting in that second house unimpeded by anything else in that house. And the other really big piece of the pie that I think we should cover today, otherwise we could probably spend about three hours, yeah. is your sixth house, which is stacked yes. with planets. So your sixth house, you have your sun sign. It is sun in Capricorn. I'm going to say you likely highly relate to the Capricorn way of life. Yes. <laughs> yeah. You, that's because you have sun in Capricorn right next to it, Saturn in Capricorn, Neptune in Capricorn, Mercury in Capricorn, and Uranus in Capricorn. So Fantastic. it is several actors on the stage, right? Um, do you know what the sixth house represents, or shall I explore that? Something to do with health? Mm-hmm. Okay, it is that's work and health. Okay. So the labors of your, the labors and fruits of your body, right? It is the last house that we would consider to be personal houses or inward-facing houses. So when you look at your chart and you see your first house in Leo, and then your sixth house in Capricorn, everything below that horizon line is inward facing. So you look at those houses and planets within them um, with an eye to what you experience personally, how you navigate things personally. So having so many things round out the internal houses in the sixth house is really exciting. You have a lot of help. You have a lot of um, interesting input. The cool thing that I want to see talk about immediately is the fact that Capricorn, whose natural planetary ruler is Saturn, is right next to your sun sign. So you really do have the classic sun in Capricorn qualities, and you're being minded by Saturn to maintain them, or else Saturn is all about time. So for you time and timeliness and taking one's time is probably quite important. So planning things out far into the future is something that you're going to do naturally. No. You're not going to speak out of turn about anything. You will have planned that beforehand. <laughs> um, the sun in Capricorn really is able to shine when it's being pragmatic. So here it's all about where can you creatively engage with the tools you have at your disposal, right? It's a long-term gratification scenario. So no quick fixes for you. You don't find any satisfaction in them anyway. No, I'm all about that long con game. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You also have Neptune in there, which is the dreamer, the mystic, your creative capacity to attune to things and tune into things, which is helpful uh, to be in that house with Saturn and your sun sign because it lets you lead from a creative place and not just a pragmatic place. And you also have Mercury. So communications will be pragmatic. You probably are a lover of bullet pointed lists. <laughs> yeah. Your, your many years of blogging on practical skills uh, speaks to the qualities of a Mercury in Capricorn in the sixth house. Um, the sixth house really is discovering, especially with your sun sign within it, how you can shine. And it has to do with facing, likely interrupting with uh, Uranus right there. Uh, Uranus is a disruptor, interrupter, a change maker of, of things, an innovator. Um, established paradigms globally, really. Um, so it's the sixth house of work and it's of health and of body 
And for you, the sun here is thrilled with the idea of scaling structures and interrupting structures that no longer work. So you have both a creative capacity, um, an interest in timeliness, uh, the ability to express, and a need to innovate. Yes, on a all of those are true. Global level, really, yeah. <laughs> for you, especially because Leo's ruled by the sun. You have so much power loaded into this sixth house of work and body that it, while you might have selected your <laughs> future and sustainability, <laughs> yeah. you have a lot of help here. So you have a lot of different planets who are on that stage, on that arena of work and they are all thrilled at the idea of discovering how how you shine through that interruption and, and addressing those systems of inequity and uh, maybe even oppression uh, in the world you are not destined for an office job where you are working for someone else in a cause you do not believe in you are destined to lead an innovative program for a better pragmatic life really is what it is so sustainability work makes perfect sense for you so i want to touch on that for a quick second because mm -hmm. there's obviously a lot of interconnectivity happening here yes and i think that's important to remember that there's two things that are, that are important to remember here one there's a lot of different ways to interpret any individual chart mm -hmm. and two someone's chart could have one planet in a completely different place and it would account for every single personality difference, every single practice like that we have differently with each other. Yeah. Um, and also we haven't gone into deep detail about it yet, but we, there are relationships in this chart. Like if you have one planet that's standing in opposition to another planet on the other side of the chart, that creates an energy between the two of them. Um, there are also different shapes that create different energies. There's a trine, which means that it is at a certain angle that will make a triangle on your chart mm -hmm. if you drew it out all the way. There is a square, there is a sextile, and it has to do with the degrees of difference between where the planets sit in your chart. So there's even more relationships and interconnectedness that we're not digging into right here, right now, but are very, very worth looking into because they can be seen as gifts and challenges. Squares are widely considered to be challenging aspects, um, especially depending on which planets are being squared or planet and ascendant, for example, would be another example of a big, big square. Um, so that's something for another episode if you want to do another one down the line. I'm down. <laughs> yeah. Um, of having your moon in the third house would change how you meet your physical and emotional needs. Uh, because it would be in Libra, not Virgo. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you're not wrong. So many things about the way one can approach their life would be different depending on where it sits and what house. And that's why it's important to choose your house system carefully because for some people, they might have a very, very small ninth house with two different signs and planets in the same place. And that's going to completely change in color the way that, that chart is read. Mm. So you have to really... I would say explore a few different options and then when you find the one that works for you work with that one right because a house system or really just a natal chart the concept of a natal chart in general is it can be looked at in so many different ways some people believe it is a cosmic imprint for their soul right some people understand it as a map of their lifetime and ways in which they might approach different challenges and different opportunities and then some people believe that it's a useful psychological lens to practice some insight, intuition, and self-reflection. And I say anything that helps somebody do that, especially now, yes. <laughs> in these times, <laughs> I, would, I would say go for it. Dig in. Why not? You don't have to be afraid and you don't have to believe that the planets are making you do things or not do things. It's a really beautiful and poetic shorthand for the universal human condition. And so you can approach it at any level that you are comfortable and gain insight into yourself. You know, we have the time. We might as well self-reflect a little bit in a way that makes us feel good and empowered versus <laughs> doomed and uncertain. I love that. And I think it's really important to 
think about it through that lens that this is not the script of your life it is a lens for which you to evaluate what has happened in your life and maybe think about different ways to behave or think or act on things that are happening in the world external to you Absolutely. Absolutely. For the longest time, I was so confused when I was younger and I understood what my sun sign was. And then I realized that I had a moon sign and they made sense to me, but that wasn't the full part of the puzzle. And then I discovered that there is an ascendant and I realized that there is a map that I could access because I love maps. Maps are really great ways of understanding things. Uh, Geology, undergrad major can't use that degree for much of anything (laughs) saying I like maps right now but um no I use that degree a lot in weird ways but um yeah it's it is helpful whether or not you want to approach it from a magical perspective it is helpful if you want to approach it from a psycho spiritual perspective or just a psychological perspective I think asking yourself do I have these these qualities and tools at my disposal and did I just not realize that I did is a great thing. Uh, the great thing about the planets and the zodiac is like they are observable in human life, and they're like I said, they're a poetic way to describe a constellation of conditions and qualities. So you can find joy in that. I mean, we find joy every day in that we send each other astrology memes on the regular. So <laughs> like multiple ones every day. Um, we skipped over this, but I just want to backtrack for a second. So the way that your chart is formed, mm-hmm. is you really only need a couple of things for it. You need your birth date, yes. your time of birth and your place of birth. And yep. that essentially gives you what you need to think of, to look at what the sky looked like at the exact moment you were mm-hmm. born. Yeah. You just need to position yourself in time and space for the snapshot of the sky. And it's gonna look different depending on where in the world you are. Uh, And exact time is quite important. If you happen to be one of those people who do not have a birth certificate handy, or you can't figure out what birth time you have, there are ways of going about it backwards. Um, There are a few different ways. You usually wanna consult a professional. Um, One of the cute ways that I've come across recently, I had someone explain that the first thing that they actually look for is who is your most significant partner in life and what is their rising sign? Because for every ascendant, there is a descendant. Mm -hmm. So opposite to the first house is going to be something in the seventh house to let you know what kind of individual you might want to partner with in your life. So significant partner for a Scorpio rising is a Taurus rising. And my husband is a Taurus rising. So as soon as I was told this, I was like, hmm, interesting. Let me figure this out. (laughs) So that's an adorable way of doing it. But if you have not had significant partners in your life, that's not an easy way of going about doing it. There are people who are very, very good at it. I like to pretend that I'm excellent at it and just be like, this is absolutely a Sagittarius rising individual. No questions asked. (laughs) I know why I am clashing with this human and it is for that reason. (laughs) But there's a few ways of going about doing it. And even if you can't happen to do that, there's something called a sunrise chart where it starts with usually an Aries first house and then moves along the zodiac belt just that way. Um, Or the whatever sign was on the eastern horizon at six o'clock in the morning. Sometimes people do charts that way. Um, And then you can decide when you look at the chart, does this make sense for me or do I need to make adjustments? So if you don't know your exact birth time, does it mean you can't participate in exploring what a natal chart can do for you? It just means that you'll probably want to be more of a detective and suss things out a little bit more. Very cool. Anything else you want to say about this before I stop sharing my screen? Uh, About your chart? Um, oh, the little degree numbers, those are the relation of that planet to... So each slice of the natal chart pie is 30 degrees. Okay. So it is telling you the degree within that 30 degree section that that planet sits in. Got it. And it can be really, really fun and cool depending on how you want to read your chart. If you get into what's called decans or decans, depending on who you ask. Um, there are different constellations that appear 
within that slice of the sky at different times during that one month period, right? In the different 30 degrees. So uh, zero degree to 10 degree Taurus will operate different, a little bit differently than an 11 to 20 degree Taurus. And you can look at the constellations for more information. So the mythology of constellations comes into play as well uh, within the degree system. Degrees are also used to understand squares, trines, sextiles, mm -hmm. those exact relationships, um, because you want an exact, you want to understand if it's exactly opposite or exactly square. And then the orbs of influence. So for you in your sixth house, 25 degrees is pretty far from six degrees. So Uranus is there in the house, but it's not whispering directly in the ear of the sun, Saturn is. So there's gonna be an influence there, but perhaps not as direct and intimate of an influence that a planet with a closer degree to your sun sign would have. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. I know we could do this for hours, so actually totally let's could. not. <laughs> Uh, okay. So obviously we've covered a lot and there are lots of tools on the internet, um, in the world in general on how to get started in looking into astrology. I remember one of the first things that I got into was astrology zone with Susan Miller. Mm -hmm. Um, and she does talk about the degrees and the relations. And I honestly don't think I ever understood any of that until maybe three seconds ago when you explained it. But there are some interesting apps that we both use, uh, and I thought we could just kind of quickly talk through the apps, the books, the people, the experts for people who are interested in diving yeah. a little bit deeper. Um, one of my favorite apps is CoStar, mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure you could say a lot more about this, but you did note in our little document here that it doesn't have whole sign option, uh, but it's it's an interesting tool I think and I like that it updates quite frequently and it'll give you weird sayings every day that I get read for filth by co-star every single day every single day it yells at me <laughs> but in a way that I need <laughs> I remember I checked it one morning and it said something and I was like oh that's stupid and then I just kept thinking about it and it got more and more true throughout the day and I was like oh that's creepy <laughs> yeah it's creepy it's creepy yeah. um you know, on the line sign to apple to be applicable to your Seriously. life yeah, it talks a lot. I think CoStar really leans heavily on uh, the movements of Mars and Venus and Mercury in regards to your natal chart. And so it makes sense uh, from a time perspective that a lot of things still will ring true. On the lines of Creepy, there's another similar app called The Pattern, which also I think compares you to like the global context and that. that. The pattern, I honestly I had to cut myself off because I would check it every day and it was just way too appropriate for the mood that I was in. And I was like, all right, this phone, this app, it knows too much about my life. I can't do this anymore. The pattern's great because you really do get to dig immediately into the reflections of other people who are sharing your pattern. Yeah. So there are a few different patterns. There's a global pattern, there's your personal pattern, and then there's it's not even necessarily about um, being social. It is anyone who has the app can reflect upon the statement that they are making. And I really sometimes enjoy scrolling to see, especially now, especially these days, um, how everyone is operating and moving and experiencing and feeling through the different astrology and play, the astrological climate that happens during quarantines. <laughs> quarantines, I love that. And then there's a couple more that, we talked about, um, I'm going to skip down to Chani Nicholas, because I know you oh, yeah. love her. So Chani, tell us. You know, I love any girl who gets up on Spotify and makes playlists for your Zodiac sign every month. What? So, <laughs> did you know she is the person in charge of the Zodiac playlists on Spotify? And did you also know that her Scorpio playlists and Taurus playlists are phenomenal every single month? Yeah, you got to know about that. Yeah. Um, but beyond that, she's now, I think, the official astrologer for Oprah. She has been on the rise for quite some time. I have loved reading basically everything she has to say about um, the zodiac, the, the way that global patterns are um, thrust upon the individual. And all of her uh, horoscopes are about affirming your ability to move through whatever is thrown at you. So 
with an eye to that, and she also writes beautifully, um, I would say definitely check her out. She's doing some amazing things in a lot of different media now. And I think she just released a book. Um, I'm going to say, no, I know she just released a book, but I think it was just two or three months ago. I might be a little off on that, but it entered my radar and I gave it to my sister as a birthday gift in April. Like that's how well she writes. So highly recommend you check out Shani. And I'll make sure to leave links for all the things we're talking about in the description box below. And percentages of her workshops and her book go to uh, domestic violence oh. and survivors groups. Yeah. Okay. So she is a woman with service mission, mission to serve, and her playlists are amazing. So yeah. respect. Let's talk about some of the other people you listed here. Brianna. Yeah, so Brianna, Brianna Sassi is one of my, when she is probably my oldest client. I started doing um, web design and development work for her maybe 10 years ago now, and it has grown uh, into illustration, graphic design, uh, commissioned artwork. I helped her design the Spinning Gold program, which is a year-long course in the sacred arts and, and folktale, fairy tale, and practical magic. Um, I love her to pieces, and she's also one of the smartest ladies that I know. So another great writer, another incredible writer, um, Libra. She is uh, making a book right now. I think she just finished uh, her final draft on a book called Star Child. So it's mm -hmm. astrology for your kiddos. Um, but she has incredible courses. Her biggest course on astrology is Star Magic. I highly recommend it. Um, she knows her stuff. She knows her stuff. And she approaches it from the perspective of uh, life affirmation, just like Shani. Also of love, of philosophy. She brings in such well-researched information and I really do dig that because then I don't have to go and investigate further on my own. She just gives it to me, which I love and a teacher. She's very, very gifted and I love her to bits. She and I created the uh, Sacred Arts Book of Hours together. So she knows her stuff and I love making art for her stuff. That's awesome. Uh, Dark Star Astrology. Dark Star is for the people who want to go deep. A, uh, dark star she speaks about decans she talks about fixed stars she talks about constellations she talks about the periphery it is that is like the deep sometimes dark mystical and exciting purple veins of astrology and the astrological origin so she she gets into it uh in a in a, in a big way so if you are not a novice but you just wanted to hear a little bit about astrology today from Friendly Faces, <laughs> you should go to Dark Star and check out what she has to offer because she has a lot of really interesting deep dives. Interesting. Maybe that'll be my next project now that I'm mm -hmm. released from grad school. I'll become an astrology Why dark not? master. Why not, right? <laughs> All right. And then Mystic Medusa. Yes. Mystic Medusa comes to you from Australia. She mm -hmm. writes in a lovely editorial style. I followed Mystic Medusa's blog for years and years and years. Uh, it's very digestible. It, it belongs in a magazine column. If magazines were still going to be a thing, she should be writing in them. Um, but she also goes beyond the classic, like what is happening right now in life and does some really interesting, really uh, well-appointed posts on just astrological concepts that maybe you wouldn't have gotten immediately. Um, one of the a more recent, I think, posts that she's done, she also has a subscription here's for really in-depth astrology, should you want to go that route. But one of the most recent posts she's done was about uh, Pluto and the book Gravity's Rainbow and Tom Pynchon and how his thoughts uh, reflected what Pluto was understood to be culturally for uh, America and the world at large at that time. And I appreciate that kind of astrological lens unto culture. She does a lot of that and, uh, and she writes with such fun. I like to read her stuff. So I think people would be interested to dip their toe into Mystic Medusa. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Lots of different options depending on where 
like how much time really you want to spend with time this. and then also like how you want to be talked to about it yeah. Great. These have been really awesome recommendations, and I'll, of course, be including details and links below, as well as ways for people to get in touch with you and buy your amazing art. Mm -hmm. um, seriously, buy a Cassie's art. It is beautiful, beautiful stuff. But I just wanted to leave it with you. If you had any last words that you wanted to say. Last words. Hmm. I would say you're the stargazer. And the stars don't tell you what to do with your life. You look at them and decide for yourself. And that's how it goes, you know? The natal chart is neutral snapshot of the sky. And you get to decide what you want to do with it. I love that. Thanks so much for being on the show, Cassie. It's been an absolute delight. And I learned so much about astrology and also myself. So yeah. always <laughs> that's what we aim for here. <laughs> All right, guys, we'll see you next time. Take care, everybody.